Father, we're grateful for your presence tonight. We're grateful for your glory. We're grateful for the gift of the local church, the privilege to be a part of the body of Christ on so many levels, Lord. We're, we're deeply grateful for that. Thank you for the beauty of the honor of our worship. Just to exalt you, Lord, tonight. Thank you for your presence in our midst. Move in the students' time together. Move in this time, in this room. But not just in this room, around the world, online. Those that are tuning in at this moment, but those that will tune in at a later moment. Captivate their hearts. May the truth and discernment and power and authority and revelation of the Word of God change us tonight. Deeply. All the way to the root. Deal with the root tonight. Lord, from every nook and cranny of our mind all the way down into our shoes, move in this house tonight. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Feed us tonight with the food that the world knows not of. And sadly, much of the church world knows not of. Feed us tonight. Give us what we need, that daily bread from the book. In the mighty name of Jesus and the church, shout it out. Amen and amen. You may be seated. You can head back to your seat. What a beautiful time of worship tonight. I want to invite you to the book of Matthew chapter 22 is where we'll take our text for our Bible study this evening. We'll actually be several places, about four various places, and I want you to to turn there or turn on there or mark there, notate there. Regardless if it pops up on the screen, and normally it does, but regardless, I I want you to have your Bibles with you. I want you to be faithful and a discerning student, men and women of the Word of God that study to show ourselves approved unto God. How many recognize that's not just the pastor's responsibility, that's all of our responsibility? We're to study the Word of God together, and so I'm grateful for you. I'm grateful for this beautiful book that we call the Bible. We've already prayed, and so we're going to jump in. Matthew, the 22nd chapter. Uh, Let me just say, by way of a context, by way of a a thoroughfare into this journey, that Jesus, in chapter 22, is setting the stage, as it were, for the wildest sermon that ever fell from his lips in chapter 23. And in chapter 23, if you think that you've ever seen a clip of Greg Locke or you've ever heard a Greg Locke sermon that you thought was just a bit buck wild and just a bit too real and raw, you've never read much in Matthew chapter 23. Because in Matthew 23, Jesus looks at the religious people of his day and he says, you fools, you hypocrites, you slow of heart, you double-minded, you literal sepulchers full of dead men's bones. And Jesus looked religion in the face and spit. And what you're going to find out, not just in that chapter, but leading into that chapter, is that Jesus and religion are not compatible. And know this and know this well. If you are merely a religious individual, you are lost with rules and regulations, but you've never been redeemed by the grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then he moves from there into Matthew chapter 24, which becomes what we call theologically the Olivet Discourse. He stands on the Mount of Olives, which by the way, Acts chapter 1, verse 10 and 11, it's the very place that his foot went up from. And the angel said, this same Jesus which she see rising into heaven shall so come again in like manner as ye have seen him go. Meaning by that, when he comes again, he's coming back to Jerusalem. He's not coming back to the White House. He's not coming to New York. He's not coming to Nashville. He's coming to Jerusalem. He's going to set down his foot on the Mount of Olives And the Bible says that when he does, Zechariah says, and the mountain shall split from the east to the west. And he begins to talk about that Olivet Discourse and his soon coming in chapter 24. He then moves into chapter 25. He begins to say, look, you need your own oil in your lamp because you can't have mine or anybody else's. And he tells the parable of the ten virgins. 
But in the midst of where Jesus is headed, these people, these Pharisees, try to trip him up, as it were, as they did often, because here's what you'll know about critical people. They're not interested in answers to their questions. They're interested in being right, regardless of what the question or the answer is. So in Matthew chapter 22, I want you to look, please, at verse number 15. It's where we're going to begin. We're going to take a journey in the word of the Lord tonight, and so I trust that you'll use your Bible. You're going to need it. Matthew 22 and verse 15, Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. You see, they lived their life for the failure of other people. You ever heard somebody say, Well, you know, I just... I believe it's God's will for me to completely destroy and annihilate another person. That's because you're a Pharisee. You see, a person that makes a big splash to cause as much damage in other people's lives as they possibly can, and then the cop-out is, well, you know, God told us to stop. We've done enough. God never told you to start to begin with because what you're trying to do is entangle people in their talk because you are so busy, busy listening to your flesh, you don't have time to hear what the sweet spirit of God says because religious people do not care who they hurt as long as they prove their point. But that's not the revelation, verse 16. And they sent out to him their disciples. You see, religious people have disciples. You notice that? It wasn't just Jesus that had disciples. It wasn't just John the Baptist that has disciples. The Pharisees sent out their disciples. Religion reproduces itself. And its offspring is always one generation more wicked than the previous one that birthed it. And they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master. Now, by the way, that was fake as could be because they did not believe that word when it fell from their mouth. That was all hypocritical nonsense. That was a smokescreen. Master. They did not believe any such thing about Jesus. Master, we know that thou art true and teachest the way of God in truth. Well, my question is, then why not listen to him? If you really believe he teaches the will of God and the way of God and the word of God, then why don't you listen to him? That's why in the American church, people say, oh, I believe what the word of God says. Then why don't you obey what the word of God says? You do not believe it if you do not behave it. And so it simply says, you teach the word of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man. Now, don't read too much into that. What it means here in the King James is you don't care what man's opinion is. And let me say this. Thanks be unto God. Because the fear of man brings a snare. So sometimes people say, well, you know, Greg Locke, you just say things sometimes and you just act like you don't care what people think. I don't. I learned it from Jesus. My Savior taught me that. He does not care about the vote of the nation. He does not care about the vote of confidence or the lack thereof. He's not interested in signing Bibles and writing best-selling books. He did not care what religion thought about him. And the reason the church in this nation is woke is because we're more in line with religion than we are relationship with Jesus. We're afraid somebody's going to say something about us. Let them talk. And more importantly, let them walk. How many times do I have to teach this congregation and teach my own heart and my own family? If people can easily walk away from your life, do not stop them. Because if they don't walk tomorrow, they'll walk in six months. Let them walk and let them talk because the chatter doesn't matter. So you don't regard the person of any man. Verse 17. Now things get weird. Tell us, therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute, pay taxes as it were? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? So these religious zealots said, hey guys, come here. We got to figure out a way to craft a conversation that makes us look intelligent and makes Jesus look ignorant because he's stealing our Sunday school crowd. And more people are going to his meetings than are coming to our meetings. And we've got to make it like we are sincere in our questioning. 
But we've got to be able to trip him up in his theological verbiage somehow. You tracking with me? That's what they're saying. So they said, is it lawful to pay your taxes? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar? We know this story. We've heard this story. But throw on the theological Jake breaks because Jesus said something that blew my spirit apart. When I noticed it this afternoon for perhaps the first time in my life. But Jesus, verse 18, perceived their wickedness. Now, we had not even got there yet, but I think it's interesting that Jesus saw the, the body language and heard the verbal language of extremely, strictly religious people. And when he looked at what they were doing, Jesus said that their religion was wickedness. That's a Jesus mic drop moment. Jesus perceived their wickedness. Do you know why the church as we know it, I'm preaching to the choir tonight, but I'm talking about across the board and around the world. Do you know why the church is powerless? Because it is filled with religious wickedness. It's filled with people that preach cute sermons in the pulpit. While they sleep with other women as they travel around the nation. It's filled with... Deacons and elders and Sunday school teachers and small group leaders that look down their long religious pharisaical noses at someone that would dare to get out of line when at two o'clock in the morning they're looking at pornographic material while their wife is asleep. And you better know something, Jesus perceives your wickedness. Religion will allow you to remain hidden and suppressed amongst non-discerning people. But when you get your nose out of the newspaper and you put it into the eternal authoritative word of the living God, it will protect your heart and mind so much that when religion walks in, you immediately say, that is biblical stupidity, real church BS. Don't die on me, I've only been going a few minutes, I got a while tonight. That's original church BS, biblical stupidity. And the church is ignorant of scripture because we live in religious wickedness. And you can know that you live in religious wickedness whenever someone like me calls it out and you bristle up and get mad about it. Holy people have nothing to hide and when holy people hear holy preaching from a holy man out of a holy Bible from the Holy Ghost, they say, give me more. I want to be holy. No spirit but the Holy Spirit. Holy people want to be told the truth. They don't bristle at it. Somebody came to the great preacher, Billy Sunday, and said, well, I don't like to hear you preach because you just rub the cat the wrong way. He said, what you ought to do is turn it around. Uh, turn the cat around. It'll get rubbed the right way. I'm not here to stroke your ego. I'm here to expose in-house and online religious wickedness. So Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, I love this, why tempt ye me? Why are, you, why are you testing me? Why are you trying my patience? Ye, watch this, hypocrites. How many times, let's be honest, how many times have you ever heard someone actually say, not even seen it written, you've seen it written, how many times in your life, however old you are, you have actually heard someone say, well, you, you don't need to call names. Stick your hand up if you've heard people say that. Okay. Jesus said, you're a bunch of wicked hypocrites. That's what Jesus said. Well, you know, for the lock, I... I think people would be more understanding of our church in the media if you preach like Jesus. Nobody would show up if I preached like Jesus. And I'm trying my best to preach like him right now. He said, you're a bunch of wicked 
hypocrites. That's the word of God. English or Greek, that's the word of God. He said, you're a bunch of hypocrites. Now watch this. He says in verse 19, show me the tribute money. You got the question? Do, do we pay taxes? Do we pay tribute to Caesar? Give me a penny. Give me the money. Hand it to me. Show me the money. And what they do? They brought him a penny. They brought him some money. Got some of that money down there, right? That original money that Jesus would have been referring to. And so they brought him a penny. Watch this. Verse 20. Buckle in. He saith unto them, Whose is this image and superscription? Here's what he asked them. He said, uh, give me some money. Somebody had something up on the pulpit a minute ago, so I'm just going to grab this just for illustrative purposes. So here's a nickel, okay? This ain't the penny he's talking about, but here's a nickel. He said, bring me the money. They brought him the money. And he said, whose image is on the money? Whose image and marking is on it? Mark 12, same context. Whose image is on the money? Watch this. Verse 21. They say unto him, Caesar's. I'm going slow because you need to follow me on this. He said, bring me the money. He brought the money. Whose mark, whose image, whose superscription is on the money? And they said, well, it's marked by Caesar. It contains the image of Caesar. Watch this. Then, upon them saying that, which they were correct, saith he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar, if his image is on the money, then the money belongs to the guy whose image it's on. Does that make sense? Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's. There is no period there. It means theologically, the thought, in fact, the same thought, continues for the rest of the verse. And unto God, the things that are God's. Now, I'm going to come back to that, but notice their response. Verse 22, when they heard these things, they marveled and left him and went their way. Now, we're about to take a bit of a journey, as the Lord revealed to me that we should. But Jesus says, bring me the money. They brought him the money. Whose image is on the money? Caesar. Therefore, because his image is on the money, you give back to the man whose image is on the money. If that is on the money, would you please say amen so I know we're going in the right place? Simple. But then he said this. And render unto God the things that are God's. Here's what he says. And you, it bears itself out in the original. Read it. We miss some stuff in hillbilly sometimes. We need to pay attention. He said, whose image is on the penny? Caesar. Then it belongs to Caesar. But then he says this. But render unto God the things that are God's. Here's what he's saying. If the image of Caesar is on the penny, which makes the penny belong to Caesar, he then says, whose image is on you? Because if you have to render to Caesar based off the image... You can only render to God something that bears His image. We are the image bearers of God. And He says, as the money bears the image of God and then makes the money belong or, or to Caesar and then makes the money belong to Caesar. So the image of God being upon you simply means that you belong to God and you're a thief if you spend yourself. And that's why they were like, oh, 
they marveled and they left him. Because we always see, yeah, yeah, just give to the government. The money belongs to the government. Ultimately, we know it all belongs to God. We get that from the principle of generosity and stewardship. But what he's saying is, if the image of Caesar on the money makes it an obligation to give the money back to the man whose image it's on, then in the same responsibility, whose image is on you. And if it's God, then why are you living for something so small other than the God that gave you his image? That blew my mind when I read that today. I'm like, holy smokes, how did I never see that? And God said, oh, son, we're not done. Go to the book of Genesis, chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, back to the beginning. Somebody told me the other day, said, Pastor, I'm interested in a girl named Genesis. I'm like, she's the one. <laughs> Glory to God, she's the one. Yeah, you better get back to the beginning, son. She's the one. You don't get but one of them in a lifetime. Genesis chapter 1, verse 25. Everybody good? Watch this. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind and cattle after their kind and everything that creepeth upon the earth for his kind. And God saw that it was good. Stop and look at me just for a moment. You know where we're going. Six days of creation, the first five, God made this, God made that, God made this, God made that. And every time he made something, he used the same reoccurring phrase. It's good. He made a cow. He said it was good. The heavens declare the glory of God. He made the sun and moon. He said it was good. He made the stars. He said it was good. Everything that he made. He made a river. He said it was good. He made a tree. He said it was good. He, he made a, a chameleon. He said it was good. He made a dinosaur because they're in the Bible. He said it was good. It was good. It was good. It was good. But when he stopped and made man, he said that is very good. Why? Because man is separate from the animal kingdom. You see, it says plainly, King James, animals are made after their own kind. An animal's image is based off a previous animal's image, but not man. By the way, that's why the devil can't stand you. Because Isaiah 14, Revelation 12, and Ezekiel 28... Do you know why the devil cannot stand you? Because he was kicked out of heaven. And because he was kicked out of heaven trying to steal the glory of God, you are made in God's image for God's glory and you have now infiltrated the camp of what the enemy wanted to begin with. Because cherubims, which then became fallen angels, demonic principalities, powers, lying signs and wonders, spirits as we would call them, demons, whatever name tag of identification, they were created not in God's image. They were created in just a special angelic way and then God says, I will make man so special that he will be set apart from the animal kingdom and he will be set apart from the angelic realm. Watch this. That's what the Bible says, verse 26, and God said. I love it when God talks to himself in the Bible. This is beautiful. And God said, let us, notice that, let us make man in our, what's the next word? Image. An animal's image isn't on you. A big bang image isn't on you. A mother earth image isn't on you the devil's image isn't on you you are not born in the likeness of an angel you are born in the likeness of a holy God we bear his image after our likeness middle of verse 26 and let them this man made in God's image have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air. You see, deliverance is what we do now because we fell from dominion. But deliverance was never the will of God. Dominion was the will of God. So now that we get deliverance, it's time to move on to dominion and take over and take back what God created us for to begin with. You weren't created for deliverance. You were created for dominion. 
And, and by the way, did you know when you see animals, they know that. That's why deer jump away. That's why rabbits run away. That's why squirrels, beep, 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 beep. that's why they go up a tree. That's why you can't just walk up and catch a bird unless it's super domesticated. Because animals have been given an understanding from the sovereign God of the universe that you are over them because you are made in God's image, not their image. Although I know a lot of church people with bird brains say amen right there. But he says, man, I got Ron laughing tonight. I heard that one. Praise God, I'm doing something. I'm on a roll. But he simply says that you're going to have dominion over the fish, the fowl, the cattle, all the earth. Over every creepy thing that creepeth upon the earth. Verse 27. So God created man in his own what? Image. And then notice this. In the image of God created he him. And then just because this book wild civilization can't figure it out. God plainly said male and female created he them. But listen. Here's why that's important. Here's why that's important. Because when you distort God's order of creation, it's for the purpose, Romans chapter 1, of changing the image that we're created in. Why is there such an assault on male and female? Because he created them in his image, male and female, created he, him, and he, them. And the world says... We're going to rebel against the image in which we are made and create our own image and worship and serve the creature more than the creator who is blessed forevermore, Romans 1.17. Which brings about the swift, severe judgment of God that, listen, I know people say, well, you know, one day America is going to be under judgment. That is foolish. America is under judgment right now. And one of the reasons is we've tried to change the image we were created in. We've tried to create, recreate the image. You see, I, I don't have time to get into all of this, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not preaching a, a vaccine message or a, or a COVID message, but let me tell you something. If you do not think for one second that they are trying to change the image and the DNA structure of our bodies so that we are made in man's image in a laboratory and not in God's image in the womb, then you are not paying attention, and you are certainly not reading the Bible. Man's main goal on the planet is to do everything it can under the power of the enemy to distort the image that we've been made in because we have been made in his image. His mark is on us. And if the mark on the money makes the money belong to the person it's marked with, then the mark on the person makes the person belong to the one who marked him and marked her with their own image. Help me, Holy Ghost. I'm telling you, that's a whole word right there. That's a whole word, and we ain't even done yet. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that we just all walk around glowing with the sovereign look of God, right? It's not saying God's white. It's not saying God's black. It's not saying God's tall. It's not saying God's small. It's saying that we have been set apart and not only are we made in his image, we are made with the markings of his likeness because there is, get this, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. Shout one. But that one God, how does he interact with us? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. There's not three gods. There's three in one and one in three and the one in the middle. He died for me. So there's not three gods. There's one God expressing himself in three unique personalities. Now, that's what it means to be made in God's image. Because I am one Greg Locke, okay? I'm not multiple Greg Locks. My wife's like, thanks be unto God. <laughs> right? But as one Greg Locke, here's what 1 Thessalonians, don't turn there, 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says. Paul says, I pray your whole body, soul, and spirit be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, what Paul was saying is this. You are one individual, but you have three expressions, a body, a soul, and a spirit. 
If you don't believe that, then you've not paid any attention to the Bible or especially to deliverance ministry. There are soul ties. There are soul woundings. There are spirits. We have a body. We have a soul. We have a spirit. So I'm one Greg Locke, but I express myself in three different ways. In a body, in a spirit, and in a soul. You see, my body is what you see. It's the shell. It's the canister. It's the housing. It's the basket. Uh, my spirit is literally the characteristics about me, the way that I express, the way my body moves, the way I speak. My soul is my eternal connection to God because Ezekiel said, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And man did not die in his body in the garden. He died in his soul. And that's why our soul must be redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Whole nother message. But we are made in God's image. That's why the Apostle Paul could come along under Holy Ghost inspiration and say in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which you have in you, and ye are not your own. You're what? You're not your own. Therefore, because of the fact that you're not your own, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which through the connection of your soul, are God's. Now, wait a minute. God just told us something that you need to sink your theological teeth into. And that is this. He owns you by virtue of the fact that he made you. And because he made you and marked you with ownership, you're a thief to live your life for anyone other than the one that marked you for his own purposes and his own glory. I read some time ago, maybe you've heard me tell this story. I haven't told it in years. A little boy named Johnny Turnbuckle. Little Johnny was a creative genius, and long story short, one Saturday he went and he built a boat out of spare everything around the house. Just found spare junk, built a boat. Took a little number two pencil and made a mast and then made a little sail out of some fabric that he found in his mama's top drawer. And then he slipped into his sister's room and in her makeup drawer he got himself some lipstick and went over there to that boat and on the side of that Sail of that boat. He put J period, T period, Johnny Turnbuckle. He marked his boat. He put a little Pepsi Cola tab on the top of it, nailed it down, tied some kite string to it, and decided to take it to the local lake. Johnny goes out and he gets his little boat and he takes it out there to the local lake and he puts it out five feet and he puts it out 10 feet and he puts it out 25 feet and he puts it out almost 50 feet, the length of the kite string. And little did he know, not watching the meteorologist, that the storm began to ensue. And all of a sudden, as the waves and the billows began to come up in that little local lake, it snapped the kite string and there goes the boat that he had diligently worked all day on and his heart sunk. He went home. Far more defeated than he walked to the local lake. Days went by. Weeks went by. One day Johnny was walking past a local toy shop. And he looked in the window and what did his wondering eyes behold? But behind the main glass of the shop under a cellophane wrapper was the boat he had made with his own hands. He ran inside that shop. He begged that owner, give me my boat back, give me my boat back. He slowed him down and said, now Johnny, listen, a little girl came in here a couple of weeks ago and said she found this boat on the shoreline of the local lake when she was feeding the ducks and I gave her $10 for this boat and I'll tell you what, I'll take this boat and keep it right here as long as it takes. But in responsibility, you're gonna bring a $5 bill. That was such an insurmountable amount of money to this little kid, but he was willing to do it. He sacrificed. He brushed his teeth, ate his peas and carrots, scrubbed the toilet, made his bed, did his homework, everything he could. A couple of weeks went by. He made himself enough to have $5 
The store opened at 9 a.m. on a Saturday. He was there at 8.15, pacing back and forth like a soldier on parade. And finally, the bell began to ring, and the store owner opened it up. Mr. Smith said, come on in, J.T., come on in, Johnny Turnbuckle. He ran in there. He threw that money down. He said, give me my boat, give me my boat, give me my boat. He said, slow down, son. I'm going to get your boat. You kept your end of the bargain. I'll keep mine. He goes over and he takes that wrapper off the top of it, <laughs> blows the several weeks and now over a month worth of dust off of it. He puts it in Johnny's arms and Johnny grabs it and puts it in his arms like it's a little poodle dog. He begins to <laughs> kiss the sail. He begins to rub that little boat and make sure it's not messed up and in, in, endangered in any way at all. And he says, thank you, sir. Thank you. Put it down for a moment. He hugged that man around his waist and picked that boat back up and began to cradle it like a little baby. Kicked the door open with his foot. He began to walk out. Just as the door was coming closed, the shop owner heard little Johnny say, oh, little boat, I love you. You're twice mine. First I made you. And then I bought you. And the Holy Ghost blows through this room and online tonight and says, you know why I love you? Because first I made you and then I bought you. You bear my image. How dare you live as a thief for yourself? How dare you live as a thief? Go to the book of Galatians for a moment, would you? Just for a moment. Galatians, the final chapter. Number six, Galatians six. Just give you an overview of what God gave me. You can study it and bear it out yourself. Galatians six, Paul has given some insight to what Acts 19 and 20 talked about. He was a night and a day in the deep. He was cold, he was battered, he was hungry, in famine, in perils, in nakedness, perils of religious people. They beat him, 39 stripes save one on several occasions. They beat him, they, they hurt him eventually. The only way the Roman government could shut him up was to chop his head off. You gotta stop this man, chop his head off. But just before they did, do you remember the final thing he wrote? He wrote what we would call his swan song to Pastor Timothy, who pastored the church at Ephesus. And he said, Timothy, henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me in that day, and not unto me only, but unto them also that love is appearing. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after themselves, heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and shall turn their hearts away from the truth. But watch thou in all things. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry, for I am now ready to be departed. And the time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight. I've kept the faith I finished the course henceforth God's got a crown for me and not just for me but for everybody that serves him and follows him and looks and longs for his appearing so here's what Paul said he said Timothy let me share something with you junior the Roman government is about to chop my head off and down the steps of the emperor's palace my head shall roll but he said, Timothy, don't you shed a tear for me because God's going to walk over, pick it up, and put a crown of life on it. Just keep preaching even when they don't want to hear it. So he's been recounting that with these religious zealots that put themselves back under the bondage of the law for no reason. Had they already been saved from it? Yes. And he said, you've fallen from grace. What it means is you have taken the grace of God so for granted that you put yourself back under a law and you have placed bondage upon you that God has already delivered you from. And I say, my goodness, that's where the church is. That's where the church is. But notice chapter 6, verse 16. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them and mercy and upon thee, might I just say, Israel of God. And there's still that. Verse 17. Whew. From henceforth, let no man trouble me. For I bear in my body the marks, the image of the Lord Jesus. 
He said, make no mistake. When I die, people will be amazed at the marks in my body. The brandings. The bullying. The berating. The cutting. The burning. The scourging. He said, I bear in my body the marks. See, I don't want to hear nothing about persecution until somebody knocks your tooth out for Jesus. I don't want to hear about persecution until you're in a jail cell. I don't want to hear about persecution until they got a gun to your head or they sawed your big toe off. Well, you know, people on Facebook don't like me. I'm under such spiritual persecution. People on Facebook don't like you for other reasons. Spiritual persecution is the least and the last of them. He said, I bear in my body. Now look, I don't have time for people to stand up and give testimony. There's people in here, you've suffered for Christ. I don't minimize that. But he's not just talking about a cute tattoo at the tattoo parlor. He says, when I pull my shirt off, he says, you can tell I've been marked by God. So listen to me. Jesus said, whose mark is on the money. Whose image? Caesar. Then the money belongs to Caesar. But whose mark and image is on you? God. Then why are you a thief and not living for the God that marked you for his glory and for his eternal purposes, not yours? And then Paul, before he dies, he said, let me tell you what I bear in my body. The marks of the marker. The images of the image giver. Because I'm going to tell you something, it's not going to be fun, but it's the facts. If we have been marked by God, we will be identified by marks for God. Especially in these last days. If we are made in his image and therefore practically, theologically, biblically, and in every other way belong to him, then our body and our lifestyle should bear out the fact that we have been so marked by him that no one questions whose superscription is written on our heart. Did you get that tonight? Are we understanding tonight that because we bear the image of God, we must render unto God what belongs to God's, and that's us? And we must say with Paul, I bear in my body the scars, the burns, the markings, the bruises, the scrapes, the scabs, the spittle, the gossip, the backbiting. I bear in my body the marks. I bear in my body the marks. You see, you will be angry at the marks if you don't know the marker. You will not escape Christianity without being bruised. You can go to a cute church and hear cute sermons your whole life. But when you are marked, you, God, and the devil and everybody around you will immediately know it. But the revelation cannot end there. It must go one tiny step further. For us to even, help me God. You can go ahead. Oh, I'm about to cry. It must go one step further for us to understand why God said something so audacious in the Bible. Have you followed me so far? Exodus. Chapter 20. I'm 
I'm about to have a come apart. His image is on me. Therefore, based off that image, the image proves the value of ownership. We are made in His image for His glory. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Revelation four eleven. We are and were created for the honor and glory and pleasure of God. So then Paul says, because of these facts, because I am an image bearer, there's the image of persecution that has been placed upon me because I've been made in God's image and I bear in my body the marks of the marked one. And he said, I'm not ashamed of that. But now, in going back to Exodus, it makes sense why God said this, chapter 20, verse 1. God spake all these words saying, I am the Lord thy God. Which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Do you see that word in the Bible? Or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not Bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity. By the way, this is generational curse. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them. Thou hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Generational blessings and cursing, same breath. But that's not the message. God says... Whose image is on the penny? Caesar. Okay. Then Caesar owns it. Give it to him. Whose image is on you? And Jesus says, oh, I can tell you whose image is on you. This is why you don't want to talk, he says. Because you are made in the image and likeness and superscription of God. And Paul says, I bear in my body the marks, the imagery of who I belong to. And that's why the marks made the difference. He was willing to be Marked up because he had already been marked by him. And here's what God said. Whose image are you made in? God's. And if that be the case, and it gloriously is. Thou shalt not make another image. You were not made in the image of a stone God. You were not made in the image of your favorite hobby. You were not made in the image of money. You were not made in the image of popularity, fame, fear, family, friends, or foolishness. You were not made in the image of sports. You were not made in the image of a car. You were not made in the image of a basketball. You were not made in the image of any of these things. You were not made in the image of Twitter and Facebook and TikTok and Instagram. You were not made in the image of your job or your boss. You were not made in the image of the church that you attend or the denominational tag that you fly or the t-shirt that you wear. And God said, Israel, I cannot allow you to worship those images because you were made in this one. And tonight when we were singing about idols, I thought, holy smokes. The American church is an idol factory. It's 
an idol factory. We worship the way we do things. We worship the people that do those things. I believe in respect. I believe in honor. But you're not made in my image. And tell some of you parents something. It's a hard lesson, but it's the fact. You're not made in your kid's image. Stop worshiping your kids. And God said, Whose mark is on the money? Caesar. And give it back to Caesar. Whose mark's on you? God's. Okay, then why are you serving other ones? And that's why God could very clearly say in what we would consider the Decalogue, the first of the Ten Commandments, the first two. He says the most blatantly blasphemous, hypocritical, disobedient thing that you could ever do is conform yourself to an image that didn't make you. To submit your life To an image that was never the will of God for you to be conformed to. And we have lived our entire lives trying to fix our image. When all we have to do is walk in the one that we're already made for. And some of you tonight have idols that you're going to have to lay down at this altar and that is your invitation right now this moment stand to your feet all over the room you don't have to bow your heads we're going to worship the Lord I'm telling you right now there's some idols that need to come down there's some things there's some images that you've been worshiping some things that you've been involved in some stuff that maybe it's good but it's not God you are not made in the image of good stuff you are made in the image of God for his glory and you ought to come and say God right now I lay my job down right now I lay my truck down right now I lay my family down I lay my bank account my savings my 401k I lay it down I lay my ministry down I lay my gifting down I lay my singing my preaching what I lay it down I lay my kids down, my grandkids down my great grandkids I lay my dog my cat I lay it all down I made in one image Do you bear in your body the marks of Jesus? If not, why not? Stop praying for the power of God and then being mad when persecution shows up at your doorstep. We're a marked people. He's marking us with His glory. He's marking us with His power. He's marking us with His presence. He's marking us with the miracle signs and wonders of the supernatural. We sing that song. Don't sing it tritely. If you want to be a person that walks in the supernatural, you will bear in your body the marks of Jesus. You will carry the image of the image in which you were created to carry. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Why would he use such a word? Because we were not made for them. We were made for him. And the cry of your heart will never be satisfied and fulfilled when you are bowing down to an image that did not create you. So let's just press in for a moment. Let's worship Him. Let's just honor Him. You take your time at this altar. You let this word sink in. You go back. You watch this word again. You you go over your notes. I'm telling you, tonight, God's marking people in this room. He's marking people in the hubs. He's marking people online. He's marking us. By the way, isn't it interesting? This is just coming to me. I'm not going to preach. That in the last days, God, the Bible says, when the 144,000 Jewish fiery evangelists hit the earth, He marks them with an image upon their forehead. And then the Antichrist shows up and says, Huh, let me change God's image 
and mark you in your face with my image. You see, the devil hates the image we were created in. He hates it. So tonight, may our hearts cry be, oh God, Romans 8, 28. What does the Bible say we're to be conformed to? <laughs> the image of Christ. Some of us, I don't say you, I say us all in this room. Some of us in this room look far too much like ourselves and not enough in the image of Jesus. Let's be marked by his image tonight. Be marked by his presence tonight. Just begin to sing. We're not going to have an official dismissal. We never do. We just say come back on Sunday. But you take as long as you need here at this altar. You pray as long as you need. We're just going to trust the Lord. Just going to trust the Lord. say this for a moment they'll, they'll sing us out here in a minute but uh, I, I don't need a barrage of people but I, I need people that are, are serious this, this is not a building situation but it is a situation with the building that I need some help with and it won't be tonight but I do need to dispatch you uh, tonight so any man in this room right any man in this room I, I guess ladies as well but I, I, I want to put this out for the men this ain't going to be applicable to anybody online unless you're driving in right but any man that has somewhat of a construction or deconstruction mindset okay i don't i'm not talking about just it's gonna be fun fellowship and to be cute and all that kind of but i'm not I'm, I'm not looking for votes and i'm not looking for a bunch of yes men nor am i looking for a bunch of ideas i've already know what the idea is god's already told me okay I need to meet you right over here on the other side of the screen for like five minutes, okay? So I need to just in, in a moment, or you can even start heading that way, whether it's five of you, 50 of you, 100 of you, 10 of you, 12 of you. I need people that are, number one, serious to hear what I have to say, and number two, have time this next week to do some stuff, okay? With, with you know, Pastor Jesse 
and, and the others that are here kind of di- di- disseminating that, not running over each other and fighting and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I, I won't be around for a couple of days uh, this next week. And so if you would be willing to help and at least hear my heart on some things that we have to do. These are not think abouts or hope so, maybe so. These are things we have to do have to do not all of it's going to be you know a, a major situation so some of you guys you just you you work with wood you work with metal you work with roofing whatever okay you you do something with your hands we need to use your hands we need your help okay we need your help if you've not been feeling manly and you want to feel manly we need your help okay so just manly yourself over that way and uh and again you're going to need to the want to and some time over the course of the next week to be here at various opportunities, okay? And so I'm going to explain that to you in just a moment. It'd be working backwards to try to explain it to everybody. It's not going to help us. So just begin to make your way over that way. And again, just going to let them sing us out. We love you guys. We'll see you this weekend. God's going to do amazing, amazing things. I love you. Thank you for being here tonight. Online community, we love you with all of our heart.